Welcome to the Grow Strong Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I interview business leaders who are committed to their own growth and the development of everyone on their team. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you for joining me again for my podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I just love bringing to you people who are focused on their own development and also are committed to helping others develop their full potential. And that's really what my company, Grow Strong Leaders, is all about as well. We have published tools and books that help people learn how to connect more effectively with each other so they live happier, fuller lives at work and at home. And you can learn more about us at growstrongleaders.com. I'm really looking forward to the conversation today with my wonderful guest, Alain Hunkins. Alain, welcome to my show. Thank you so much, Meredith. I'm so excited to be here with you today. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I'm really looking forward to um, the things that I know you're going to be sharing with my audience. And I first want to give a big thank you to Amy Bernard Bond, because she's the reason we know each other. And she was my guest on episode 139, which was another wonderful conversation. So I encourage my listeners to check out that episode. Before we start our discussion, I want to just introduce you to my audience. A lot helps high achieving people become high achieving leaders. And over his 20, 20 year career, Alain has worked with thousands of groups of leaders in 25 countries. And clients have included some names you'll recognize like Walmart, Pfizer, General Electric, IBM, Microsoft, and there are a lot of others. And in addition to being a leadership speaker, consultant, trainer, and coach, he's the author of Cracking the Leadership Code, Three Secrets to Building Strong Leaders. He's also a faculty member of Duke Corporate Education, and his writing has been featured in publications you know well, such as Fast Company, Inc., Forbes, Chief Executive, and Chief Learning Officer. Welcome again. Let's get started. Yeah, let's get started. So I want you to share with my audience your unique personal story because it's quite moving and has influenced your thinking and your being over all these years. Sure thing, Meredith. So interesting, you said, you know, your unique personal story. And I'd invite all of us listening, you know, when I was growing up, certainly I never thought of myself as having a unique story because it's, ah, it's just me. But as I've gotten older, as recognizing we all have these unique stories and, you know, stories create beliefs and beliefs shape our lives. So, yeah, I'll tell you about my story. And it is somewhat unique. So I grew up in New York City, not particularly unique. I was raised by a single mom and my grandmother. Again, not necessarily all that unique. But the unique part of the story is the fact that both my mother and my grandmother are survivors of the Holocaust. So my name is Alain because it's a French name. My mother was born in Brussels, Belgium in 1935. And if you know your 20th century history, you know that uh, Brussels was invaded. Belgium was invaded by the Nazis at uh, end of 41, beginning of 42. And my mother's family is Jewish. And so they were literally hunted for their lives. And as was the case in Belgium, uh, there was a Belgian underground that basically took Jewish children, like my mother, who was at the time six and a half, seven years old, and they basically took them away. And so separated her from her mother, which is, again, I have kids and just imagining being taken away. And my mother spent about three years in hiding, being moved from place to place and didn't get to see her mother, except occasionally they would create these uh, reunions. And this is, I use that word loosely because literally it was, they were basically able to go down a street and walk. I couldn't stop, but they could make eye contact, but then keep walking so they could see each other. And that was the extent she could see her mother um, every few months or so. I mean, what a, a horrific 
uh, life to have to go through all of that. And anyway, so my mother, yeah, she had her hair dyed blonde. She was given a false name to learn. She lived in a convent for a while. She moved, I think she was in nine different places over the course of three years. And during, toward the end of the war, my grandmother was actually arrested and imprisoned by uh, the Nazis and put into a holding camp, a concentration camp called Malin, or Mechlin is, is the Flemish word for it. And it turns out she got put in that camp and she got there nine days after the last transport troop train to Auschwitz left. And no one from that troop train ever came back alive. And so uh, miraculously, both my mother and my gran grandmother survived the war and they were reunited at the end of the war. As you can imagine, that experience really shaped their worldview afterwards. And so I grew up, I was born in 1968 in New York City in Queens. Uh, my parents divorced early on. My grandmother moved in. So my primary parents were these two, my mother and my grandmother. And so can you imagine what your levels of trust would be in the world after you'd lived through an experience like that? So, you know, I was, I was literally told things like, never tell anybody anything unless they ask you and you have to share it. I mean, it was that really low trust because let's face it, it was, we'd call it now, we'd call it post-traumatic stress. And mm -hmm. they didn't have words for that necessarily then. And of course, at the time, no one talked about it. And it was just the way things were. And I think for me, that set me on my journey to really wonder deeply about humanity, what it means to be human, because, you know, I was in public school, I'd go to my friends' houses and the mood or the vibe, the energy, the culture at my friends' houses was so different than it was in my house or even at school. In fact, I became a really good student because it's like, oh, I know how this works. I know what to expect because at home, I could never know exactly how my mother or my grandmother might be feeling or acting in a certain way because all of that trauma influenced them deeply. So that's what set me on the course to really being kind of pretty tuned in and sensitive to other people, which led me to studying psychology and led me to studying theater. I mean, these are all aspects of the human condition, which then led me to doing work in education and then ultimately adult education and training. Because really, I think for me, this led me to a mission, which is about, I want to create, a, similar to what you said, Meredith, about helping people to their potential. So for me, it's I want to create a vibrant and alive world by helping to kindle the fire of brilliance in people. Because I look at, you know, the experience of my own mother and my grandmother, and it's amazing how, you know, their wartime experience literally ended in 1945, but they carried that with them really for the rest of their lives. And how all of us can, in some ways, be imprisoned by our own thinking and at the same time, we can all be liberated out of the cages of our own thinking if we have both the right role models and the right tools and the willingness to take that hard and courageous look in the mirror and think about what can I do to be a little bit better tomorrow? Mm -hmm. mm. Wow. It's hard to follow up with a question yeah, of course, from of course. that, just absorbing mm -hmm. everything that you shared, but it does inform me of uh, the spirit with which, you know, you come to the work that you do. And I know that one of the key things that you have taken on, I guess, as a mission is really helping leaders understand what's needed to be an effective leader today. And one of the statistics that I know that you have shared is that only 23% of people feel or think that their leaders lead well. And so, you know, a question for you is how on earth did we get to the point that we have so many people having such low confidence in the people who lead them? Yeah, that's such a provocative question, Meredith. If you think about it, folks, it's that only 23% of people lead well. And just if you work for a leader that does not lead well, how comfortable would you be going and telling them that directly? <laughs> Most people I talk to say, I would never tell them that because especially in an organization, that's a career limiting move. You know, they have, unless they have invited the feedback and my sense is the leaders that create that kind of psychological safety, that openness, that level of trust say like, I want to hear what can I be doing better? My sense is they're probably already in that 23%. They're few yes. and far between. And here's, I mean, we got here because and this is so common. Whenever I talk to people in organizations, they all shake their heads with, yes, this is a truth response. Yes. 
So many people that we know have wound up in these roles of leadership, of formal authority in organizations because they were really good individual contributors. They were high performers who got things done. And when you're good and get things done, you get recognized and they think, okay, well, we want to reward and encourage and promote that. So what do we do? You're a really good software engineer. Let's make you the manager of the whole team of software engineers. Now, did you just notice something? Those are completely two different skill sets, right? So there's a huge difference between being a high performer and being able to facilitate high performance in others. And the challenge is so many people who get it, once we get into those roles, we also start to have our egos inflated, like, look, I'm here, I'm the boss, I'm in charge, I'm the fixer. And so we are even less likely and open to feedback to help us get better. And so we tend to resort toward the behaviors of things that we think leaders ought to do. And where do we take our role models from? Well, from the leaders that have been around us. And if the vast majority of people that you've known as leaders have been lousy, like it or not, you're probably going to inherit a lot of those behaviors. I'll just tell you a quick funny story around this one. So uh, this, I have a couple of kids now. My, my son is, his Alex is 18. My daughter Miranda is 15. So this is about when they were, gosh, probably about seven and four. And so the two of them were in the living room and they were playing and they were getting very goofy and loud. And I was trying to get something done in the kitchen. And I have to confess, Meredith, this is not one of my best parenting moments. Um, I got a little triggered and I walked into the living room and this is what I said. I said, would you two stop behaving like children? <laughs> now, now I'm telling you this for two reasons. Number one, that's a stupid, ridiculous thing to say to a couple of kids because they are children. But the really reason, the reason I'm telling you the story is because as soon as those words came out of my mouth, I went, oh my gosh. Those were the exact same words my mother used to use with my brother and I, right? I had parroted, like unconsciously repeated the behavior of my mother. And so I think, why do we lead the way we do? Well, we kind of all learned this stuff from our parents or our earlier on bosses and stuff. And for the most part, what most of us have inherited is an industrial age, mechanical engineering way of command and control. Do this. Why? Because I'm your boss. That's why, which is a variation of because I'm your dad or I'm your mom or I'm in charge. So just basically shut up and do it. And we expect compliance. Compliance only works to a certain level. And it worked better back in the age of the factory worker and the assembly line where the work was repetitive. It was fairly unskilled. And you could just do the same thing every day, every week, every month, every year, day in, day out. However, think about the work that the people who you are leading now do. It involves creative problem solving and clarifying what the issues are, generating ideas, developing ideas, implementing solutions. It takes a whole different skill set. And so just telling people, just shut up and do it, isn't going to work in this knowledge work digital age in which we live. And so, yeah, so how did we get here? Because so many leaders in the 21st century are still clinging to these old 20th century mindsets of what it means to be a leader. So when you think about workers today, what is it that they are looking for that is not being delivered? Yeah. You're saying the, that the, that many of the current leaders are relying on the past, the yeah. old way of doing things, which isn't working. It's not meeting the needs of folks. What is it people today need? And well, this is a real, Really interesting question, right? Because what is it that people need? And not only do what they need, but what do they expect? Because if mm -hmm. we look at the, the workforce today, I mean, we still have still a few, we still have a couple of silent generation, like less than 1%, a few baby boomers, like maybe five or 6%, a bunch of Gen X, then we've got Gen Y, Gen Z. So you're looking at, that's like five generations in the workforce. And I get to work with all of them and I have worked with all of them. And I'm a Gen Xer, right? I'm 53 years old now. So if you look at the expectations, like when I started in the workforce, you know, the expectation was if your boss told you to do something, you did it. I mean, there was much more of a conform, comply. Don't talk back. Don't ask questions. Don't ask why. But the fact is, what do people expect in the world? Our expectations keep going up and up and up. And just to use an analogy, remember, for those that are old enough to remember when cell phones came into existence, it's like, oh my gosh, this technology is amazing, right? I can carry this thing in my pocket. And so they, and now just think about it. Now you're like, you're streaming video, you're multitasking on your phone. And when it buffers for half a second, you're like, why isn't this happening faster? Right? Because your expectations have increased. You know, think about what Amazon has done with one click ordering. You know, you can order things with one click. 
suddenly you're like, oh, this is taking six clicks. This is too much. I don't want to do this. So our expectations keep going up and up and up. And so when it comes to the workforce and being an employee and choosing to be led, first of all, especially, and the majority of our workforce today are millennials and Gen Z. And they were raised in a culture where they expect to be respected for who they are. Now, you know, we get into all this, you know, we hear like, oh, these new people in the workforce, they're snowflakes. They want it. They want the corner office after two weeks. No, they, what they really want is what we've basically entrained them for, which is you're a human being, you should be valued and respected. And they don't want that to go away when they walk into the office. And so what they're really wanting is to be seen and recognized and valued as a human being. And they want to keep learning and growing because we live in a world where, again, with that computer in your pocket, you can be both entertained and educated and inspired all the time. And if the work environment is dull, disengaging, and boring, they'll want to opt out. They want to be in an engaged environment all the time. And so the bar for what is permissible and acceptable is less, you know, it's, it's higher. And the other piece to all that is the fact that, you know, in this knowledge work age with LinkedIn, Indeed, Glassdoor, the level of transparency that we have today is people know where the grass is greener and they are not afraid to hop the fence. Again, people of my parents' generation, when they were in the workforce, you had a job, you stuck with it, you know, and that was, and now job hopping is the new normal. No one expects to be here because, you know, we've gotten rid of a lot of the social structures like, you know, pension funds and retirement, like those are gone. And so, you know, I think Dan Pink, you know, called coined the term free agent nation. You know, we live in a, a nation of free agents. And so people realize that their skills are marketable and that they have to create, you know, this idea of personal brand and that brand can go shopping to the highest bidder, as it were. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you've talked to some of these younger people, what are some of the things they're looking for in a leader? Um, just so that my listeners who are in leadership roles can evaluate, gee, do I do that or not? Yeah, great point. Yeah. So number one thing that people want, they want to be valued and respected as human beings, right? So they don't want to be treated like a number or a cog or a box in your org chart. They don't want to be thought of as task getter dunners. I mean, yes, they have to, they know that they have to get tasks done. They know that the organization needs to deliver certain results to stay in business. They get all that. And they want to be seen as people. So that's number one. They want to kind of be valued and respected, esteemed as human beings. Um, the next thing they want is they want to know that what they're doing matters. So are you as a leader reminding them of the mission and the purpose of your organization? And it's not okay for you to say, well, we did that during onboarding. I mean, that's the equivalent of saying, well, you know, you know, if I said my wife's name is Mary, well, Mary, you know, I know we got married uh, in 2003 and I said, I love you on our wedding day. I mean, it's still good, right? I know I haven't said it since, but like, Nothing's changed, right? It's the same principle. Like you have to remind people of their mission and purpose and why we're doing what we're doing on a regular and consistent basis. So people want to, so, so we talk about value, we talk about purpose. Another thing is people want to see how what they're doing is contributing to that purpose and how what they're doing is making progress. So there's a wonderful book by a, a professor emeritus at Harvard, Teresa Amabile, wrote a book called The Progress Principle and did all this research and basically found that the number one thing that motivates people is the sense that you are making progress towards a mm. meaningful goal. So one thing that is unfortunately in short supply with a lot of leaders is the ability to actively communicate and celebrate small wins. So the, the idea is that you're not going to be delivering giant targets every day, every, like, like, oh, we hit our annual numbers. I mean, so often what ends up happening in cultures is let's say, yeah, we're going to, we're going to, I'll use a sales example because it's easy. You know, we've got to deliver on hundred million dollars in sales. And so we do that. And then the next day is like, we've raised the targets to 110 million for the next year and we're back at it. And unfortunately waiting to be motivated by some milestone once a year just isn't enough. And so how do we break these things down? So we have on a frequent basis, little wins that we can celebrate along the way. Because think about it, there's a kinetic energy and momentum that is developed when people feel like they are part of a winning team that they are contributing to. Mm -hmm. So that's the next thing. So winning. And then the last thing I'll say around what leaders can do for people is people want to keep learning and growing, right? They want to know why they're doing, they want to know the purpose, but also 
how can I keep growing and learning? Because people realize the world is so uncertain. They, they want to feel like the skills they're developing will serve them in good stead moving forward. And if they don't want to stay bored and plateaued, you know, it's interesting. Um, if you, I, I spent a lot of time growing up through school when I was in college and beyond waiting tables. And it's amazing. Anyone who's ever worked in any service industry knows that the day flies by much faster when you're actually busy. And even if you're getting hourly paid, you might be thinking like, wow, I'm in this job. Let's say retail, you're working at a clothing store. Like I get paid the same, whether we're super busy or whether it's really empty. You might think like, oh, people would actually prefer it when it's slow because they don't have to work so hard. Turns out hard work isn't what drains people. It's meaningless work that drains people. Actually, people want to be engaged in the moment because then you lose yourself. You're not watching the clock. You want to lose yourself in the project. That's what they talk about when they talk about the flow state. So anyway, those are a bunch of things that leaders should be focusing mm. on when it comes to what people are looking for out of work today. Yeah, those are excellent. I hope folks take notes on those because I think the question that to ask yourself is, am I doing this? You know, am I treating this person with respect? Am I giving them meaningful work? Am I helping them feel valued? Am I tying it in with the the mission and goals and celebrating those small wins. In fact, I think you call those peak moments. Yeah, I right? do call those. So talk a little bit more about that. How can um, that be made part of uh, the company way of doing things? Yeah, we talk about peak moments. And the other thing I'll say, and thank you, it's a great recap of the list, Meredith, is this idea of it's also, you can hear those things. And maybe you're listening and thinking, oh yeah, I do that sometimes. I do that sometimes. And the question I would invite all of us and challenge us with is, are we doing it consistently on a daily basis? Because great leaders are practicing these behaviors consistently on a daily basis. And they're not just doing it oh, every quarter. Oh, yeah, every half a year, every, oh, at the performance review, I'm going to thank you for the great job you're doing. But this should just be a part of who you are, part of your DNA. So yeah, so peak moments. So the idea is that not all moments are equal in any experience. And there's certain ones that cast a bigger shadow or carry more weight. You can pick your analogy on that one. And so if you think about it, and I'll go back to my working in a busy restaurant example. So if you think about it, when you sit down at a restaurant, the next 90 seconds makes much more of a difference than 90 seconds when you're eating. Right? When you sit down, you expect to be greeted. You expect to be handed menus and asked, do you want something to drink? Right? Whereas while you're in the middle of dinner, if someone doesn't come back for 90 seconds, you're busy, you're occupied. So not all emotional experiences are weighted equally. And so you take that into the workforce, the same thing applies. So for example, when people are onboarding their first day at work, what is their experience like? Do they feel like when they show up, you know, in my book, I write this whole story about this guy I worked with. He shared his very horrible first day where literally he showed up and the person who he thought was meeting wasn't there. And he sat in the lobby of the office building waiting and waiting and waiting. And then finally someone showed up about 45 minutes late and said, oh yeah, well, she couldn't meet you. She's on a trip, but I'll take you around. And then it was a lot more waiting and just basically felt like a second class citizen and buy and, and then went down to get, for example, the, the ID tag at security. And that took another 45 and just felt like then ended up sitting in an office by themselves and waiting for IT to show up with a laptop. By the end of the day, they're like, this, this place sucks. And they quit. And that's not that, I'd hate to say that's common. It's not that unusual. And so thinking about peak moments. So what are we doing to celebrate that first day? What are we doing to celebrate someone's first success, whatever that might be in their particular area of expertise? What are we doing to have them feel connected to the work community? You know, there's so many opportunities for people because, you know, wouldn't it be great if after that first day, that you created such an engaging, enlivening experience that that person went home and told their friends or their parents or anyone like, oh my gosh, I got to tell you about this company I work with. They did this, they did this, and they did this. And they, it's amazing, right? They treated me well. And, and then they become your raving fans. And it's amazing how that goodwill will create this wonderful halo effect that if the next couple of days don't have to be that amazing, but they'll carry that momentum with them forward. And so realizing... Yeah, as we've all heard, you only get one chance to make a first impression. And so there are certain times of, of in the life cycle that it makes a difference. So those are the times to really watch out and be aware of. And I call those peak moments. Mm -hmm. 
What a great story. It's it's mind boggling to think that people are treated that way. It goes back to your very first point about how being treated as a human being and yeah. that whole experience violated <laughs> that dramatically. Yeah. Well, I want to get into the subtitle of your book, because you talk about the three secrets to building strong leaders, and you very smartly had all of them that start with the same letter. Yes. <laughs> so so tell us what those three are and what you mean by each of them. Yeah. And I want to preface this story about you know, the three, because you're going to say, oh, you're going to hear them. That's really cute. They all rhyme. They all start with the letter C. It's not like I sat down to write a poem or a haiku or something. It wasn't like, oh, let's just write this. These three C's, and I'll get to them in just a moment, came out of working with thousands and thousands of groups over the course of two decades. And because what I kept seeing were the same patterns emerging. And I started taking notes and those notes turned into blogs. And then what I ended up doing is after four years, I had over 300 blog posts and I looked for what are the common themes? And I kept seeing these three things emerging time and time again, turned out that, that the best leaders kept doing these things and the worst leaders didn't. And so the three C's finally, drum roll, please, right? Our number one is around connection. And that's obviously what I start with, right? Because at the end of the day, you are leading human beings who have a innate biological wiring desire to connect. We are mammals and we need to connect with other human beings. That sense of feeling included, the need for belonging is so powerful. So it starts with connection, understanding that people need to be connected, that you see them, you understand how they feel. So once we have connection and we're going to try to get things done, but how do we do that? It's through our second C, which is communication. And one of the things that is so important for leaders to recognize is that misunderstanding is the default setting for human communication. In other words, without super intentionality, the likelihood is there's going to be misunderstanding. You know, you're going to default to that more likely. And so what leaders need to do is learn a whole series of skills of how do I make sure that I create common and shared and mutual understanding? And how can I start to recognize what are the pitfalls that are going to get in the way of that? And the reason that shared mutual understanding is so important is understanding if it is strong, it is the foundation on which we take all future action. So if it's a strong, solid foundation, we're going to make some really good decisions, which means that'll lead to some really good results. If that foundation is tippy and wobbly, we're going to make some poor decisions. Surprise, surprise. We're going to end up with some poor results. Mm -hmm. And so being kind of a vigilante and just, you know, ruthless to make sure, making sure that we are walking away as opposed to going, well, I think we're all professionals. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like we won't talk, like we get it, right? You know? Um, so that's number two. So it's around communication. And then the third C has to do with, as a leader, what am I doing to create an environment where people can work together at their best? And that C is around collaboration. So it turns out that the best leaders create strong environments by design, whereas the poor leaders, they're also creating environments, but they don't know that they're doing it, which means they're creating environments by default. They're not even thinking about it. They don't know what they don't know. And so what's the culture that you're creating? Turns out that Gallup did this wonderful study a few years ago. They found when it comes to culture is that 70% of the variance between lousy, good, and great team cultures is directly attributable to that team leader, not the company, but that team leader, which is why I'm sure many of you have heard the expression, People don't leave companies, they leave their bosses. Because depending on who you work for within a company, it could be like you're working for two different companies, or some people might even say, depending who I work for, it's like working on two different planets. Because as leaders, there's so many things that we do to set the tone for that. So that all comes back to what am I doing to connect, to communicate, and to collaborate? So those are the three secrets to building strong leaders. You're so excellent at uh, articulating those and describing what they mean, what they look like, and what yeah. happens when we don't do them well. Thank you. You're um, welcome. So related to that first one of connecting, you said something that made me think about empathy, mm -hmm. because I know that empathy is key for you. In fact, I think you recommend leading 
with empathy. So I want to hear you describe what do you mean by that? What does that look like? And what are the benefits of doing that? Yeah, so it's interesting. So there's been more and more research on empathy. And just to do a little level setting here, empathy, I define it best as showing people that you understand them and care how they feel. You know, Maya Angelou has this wonderful quote that some of you might know, which is, and I'll slightly paraphrase that, you know, ultimately people won't remember what you said. They won't even, even remember what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And just that is the basis of empathy. And biologically, you know, we are wired to connect. And also at the same time, when we feel disconnected, it shuts us down. And so as you hear this, you might be thinking, okay, empathy, showing people you understand them, care how they feel, get it, got it, good, thanks a lot, move on, check the box, next thing. It's one thing to conceptually understand empathy. It's another thing to actually live it and practice it. So it turns out that we all experience and demonstrate empathy with some people. It turns out that the people that we feel closest to, such as immediate family members, close friends, we feel a natural empathy for. But people who we think of as different or distant or other don't make the empathy cut. Mm. And it's interesting. You might be thinking about, so there was an interesting study by a business solver a few years ago, and they found, they asked organizations and their CEOs, do you think your organization is empathetic? Well, you know, I think most people get it. So 92% of the CEOs in those organizations said, yes, our organization is definitely empathetic. Well, it turns out the very same organizations, the employees, only 50% of the employees felt that their CEOs were empathetic. So I think, again, one of the things that leaders need to bridge is the gap between our intentions and our impact. You know, a psychologists call this the fundamental attribution error. So we tend to judge ourselves by our intentions, aka I'm a good person. Mm-hmm. I care. I feel right. Versus the impact, which is, I don't think you care that much. I don't think you spend enough time with me. And so in my research, and I write about six different ways in the book, like people get in theory, why empathy is challenging. And they also understand what they should be doing. But the fact is empathy in the workplace is harder than it seems. And I'll just, I won't go through all six with you, but I'll share a couple of the big reasons And this comes up time and time again. If you think about it, empathy is showing people you understand them and care how they feel. Guess what? That takes time. And most people I know are feeling pretty stressed out that they got too many things to get done. And this just becomes yet another thing to put on their list. And because they feel the pressure to deliver whatever X result they're trying to deliver, this gets pushed off to tomorrow. Oh yeah. I mean, I care how you feel, but I don't really have time. So it's more like, Hey Meredith, how are you? Good. Anyway, let's get going. Right. It's like, (laughs) Like that's it, that's, that's the kind of level of check-in. Like we just literally have two seconds for that and then we move on. So one of the big barriers is time. You know, and again, in a digital world, you know, we can send emails at the speed of light, but human relationships move at the speed of humans, which is a lot slower. So part of leadership wisdom is knowing there's a time and a place to go fast, but there's equally a time and a place to go slow. And great leaders know how to prioritize You want to put people and slow down, put people before you get into task, because that going slow will build a level of trust to move forward. Because the other question you asked was, what are the benefits to empathy? Empathy builds trust and trust delivers results, right? If you think about it, because when you people feel empathized, you like, you start to trust them. The other thing it does is when people feel that level of empathy, it creates a culture for innovation. People feel more open and safe to share ideas and come up with creative ways to problem solve. So ultimately, empathy helps to deliver these results. The other big barrier to empathy is that a lot of people, particularly in the business world, have been socialized and learned how to get very comfortable with certain parts of life. Like, for example, it's very common for a lot of CEOs to be former CFOs and accountants. And the world of numbers is very neat and tidy. And human beings and their emotion in life can get kind of messy at times, right? So if I say, Meredith, how are you today? It's different because if you bring the number seven into a meeting, I know that seven every single day is always one more than six and one less than eight. I never have to worry going, well, actually, I have a sick kid at home and, you know, my partner's got COVID and like, you know, so it's like whatever it is, right? We're messy by nature. And it doesn't mean that you have to be a therapist. We're not saying you have to like have that level of skill, but what it does mean is you need to be an empathetic human. In other words, ask people how they feel and be open and patient 
and compassion enough to listen to them. You don't have to solve it or fix it, but just to take some time to listen. And, you know, feelings are not meant to be controlled. They're meant to be expressed because like I said, it goes back to connection. As humans, we want to be connected and wired and letting people know what's really going on. And what I'm seeing, especially over these last couple of years through the pandemic, is this the need for people to feel connected and not isolated is more important than ever before. So if you're looking for ways to find a fast track to empathy and connection, the number one thing I would recommend is start practicing listening with purpose, really parking your own agenda to the side and taking time to listen to someone deeply and fully. It won't take as long as you think it does, yet it will make a huge, huge difference. Mm. Wow. So much wisdom in everything that you have shared. Oh, and I can't believe our time is coming to an end. The, the points you just made about empathy are so important. I want to encourage people to re-listen to that segment of this interview. Actually, you, everything you've said is worth listening to repeatedly because you've made such important points about human beings your focus on connection, communication, collaboration are so key to individual success and success of a team and an entire organization. Thank you for just all the wonderful insights you've brought today to our conversation. I would love for you to share with um, my listeners how people can connect with you, learn more about the services you provide and get a copy of your wonderful book, Cracking the Leadership Code, Three Secrets to Building Strong Leaders. Thanks, Meredith. Yeah, so the easiest place to go is to my website, which is www.allahunkins.com. I'll spell that for you. It's A-L-A-I-N-H-U-N-K-I-N-S.com. And if you just scroll around there, you can certainly be in, it has, shares all the different services, whether it's speaking or training or coaching or consulting. You can also go to the resource section. There's a place you can then link to the book. You can actually download the first chapter of the book while you're there. I also have a link to a newsletter that I send out monthly called the Building Strong Leaders Newsletter uh, that goes out once a month. And also you'll see one of the things I offer is I've taken a lot of the lessons from the book and actually put them into an online gamified app-based 30-day leadership challenge, which I do three open challenges a year. So there'll be information about the next upcoming challenge, depending on when you're listening to this episode. And feel free also to connect with me on LinkedIn. And since you've listened this far, if anything else comes up for you, you have now joined the end of the podcast club. You can directly email me and I'll give you my email address, which is my first name, Alain, A-L-A-I-N, at Alain Hunkins. Same A L A I N H U N K I N S dot com. And I do respond to all emails I get from podcast listeners. And thank you for listening so far. And thank you, Meredith. This has been phenomenal. Oh, you know, to me, you are such a gift to the world, Alan. The things that you are talking about and the impact you are, you know, desiring to have and you are having with all the people lucky enough to work with you is just phenomenal. Thank you for writing your book so more people can learn about it. And thank you for continuing to be who you are in the world. I appreciate you. Mm, thank you so much. I appreciate you too. Thanks for tuning into my podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com and check out our two books, Connect With Your Team and Peer Coaching Made Simple. While you're there, download the free facilitator guide to find out how to implement our unique peer coaching system. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell.